On this edition of Bay Area Bountiful, we explore some of the traditions of native people and their relationship to the environment. First, Pomo basket weavers are preserving this ancient tradition and caring for the habitats that sustain the plants used to make baskets. Then we visit the Klamath River Basin, where tribes are fighting to secure traditional fishing rights. Finally, we discover the Sacred Seed Project, which protects indigenous crops. It's all coming up next on Bay Area Bountiful. Bay Area Bountiful is made possible in part by Rocky the Free Range Chicken and Rosie the Original Organic Chicken. The Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, Made Local Magazine and Sonoma County Go Local. And through the generous support of Sonoma Water, Cultivate, celebrate, connect. The Pomo basket weaving tradition in Northern California has been passed down for generations, but development projects and the encroachment of invasive non-native plant species continue to threaten the survival of the native plants used to make the baskets. Clint McKay and his family are working to preserve these riparian habitats for future generations as they carry on this ancient basket weaving tradition. I tell people baskets are so important to us because when we come into this world, we come in to it in a basket, and when we go out of this world, we go out in a basket. And everything that happens in between for my people revolves around basketry. And so those baskets and those roots that we use, those are the roots that bind me to my ancestors. The roots of those plants are the roots of my people. This is a special place for me. This is part of the ancestral territory and homeland of the Dry Creek Pomo. My people have been here since time began. Back in the early 80s, the Army Corps of Engineers decided to build Lake Sonoma and Warm Springs Dam and there's a lot of archeological sites in this area and all the way up Dry Creek Valley, not only from the Dry Creek people, but from the Macamo, the Cloverdale Pomo people as well. Part of the mitigation plan was to attempt to account for the loss of basketry materials that my people have collected since time began farther up Dry Creek Valley. This is our classroom. This is where we learned about ourselves, about how to be, and what it means to be a Pomo or a Huapo we would speak our language and learn to identify these plants in our language. While we were digging, we would listen to the stories of our elders talk about the early days and the way our people lived, even though now maybe some of it's private property, maybe some of it's federal property. But in our hearts, this is still Indian land. This is still Pomo land. Sometimes people have the impression that the native way is to be hands off and just let nature take its course, but that's not it at all. In order for us to maintain that reciprocal relationship with nature, we need to be hands on and we need to be active in the care. We've noticed a steady decline in the quality and quantity of sedge that's available for us to gather here. When they release water from the dam, goes down Dry Creek, it washes away the topsoil 
and the good nutrients and all that mulch that would normally feed the sedge is just washed down and there's nothing to replace that. So we're working with the Army Corps to identify ways that we might rehabilitate some of the sedge beds. This is a non-native plant that we battle with out here in Dry Creek a lot. This is, uh, we call it myrtle, but I think it's called vinca or something like that. So this has taken over a lot of our sedge out here. So this is one of the those invasive species that we're constantly trying to keep at bay and keep out of our beds because they'll come in here and they'll wind up just choking out all the sedge. See, it's not about not about being in a hurry or how fast you can dig them out. You just got to be patient, and careful with them. And that's showing them respect. Because if you break one of these roots, that root won't just grow back. And there's another sedge root. For us as Pomo people, that's probably what we're most well known for, is our basketry. We don't have pottery here, so we don't have pots. And uh, like the Northwest Coast folks that used a lot of wood and carving and things like that for bowls. And uh, we don't have that here. We didn't do that. So everything in our world revolves around baskets. Our ceremonies are performed with baskets. We bathe our babies in baskets. When we go out and gather our food, we gather it in a basket. We store our food and valuable items in a basket. We cook in baskets. We eat out of baskets. We hunt with baskets. We fish with baskets. Uh, one of the most precious gifts a Pomo or a Wapo person could give you is a basket. People talk about it being an art form and our basketry being beautiful, and we appreciate that. But to us, it goes much farther. We don't refer to it as an art form. To us, it's the very essence of who we are as Pomo and Wapo people. For our closed twining and our coiled work, this willow is the foundation for those type of baskets. That's nice. And so kind of like we said with the sedge, you know, you might say, well, how many pieces of willow does it take to make a basket. Well, how big is the basket and how long is your willow, right? So to us these baskets are living and breathing things and so when we travel to different places and we see excessive amounts of baskets that are locked away in some storage facility somewhere. It's really sad for us. At some point the right thing is letting those baskets, letting those people come home. The salmon of the Klamath River Basin have been integral to the survival of native people in Northern California for centuries. Modern development and political policies have led to agricultural irrigation and dam building which threaten salmon habitat. Now the community is fighting back.
Yurok been fishing the rivers since the beginning of time. We've been fishing all up and long down the river and on the coast even and in all the villages above. Pulakla, and the Pulakla is a downriver people. That's where my people come from on the Klamath River. The river does so much for us. It not only brings us our food, it brings us everything we need. We're at Rekla, at the south side of the Klamath River, where the river meets the ocean. And that's what Rekwa means. It's where it goes into the ocean. It's the mouth, this is where it all starts. This is where everything comes in, where everything goes out. So it's a circle of life down here. I'm gonna do a drift net, just a basic 30-foot drift net, throw net. You can throw it off the beach and let it drift down and hope something hits it. The Yurok and the other tribes used dip nets, trigger nets, but as they had a catch to eat, so they got really good at it. They dip netted here. Still to this day, we still dip net. We have a self-implemented closure just to let, you know, the river have a break as we're supposed to have a real low salmon here this year. Rules will change based on the conditions of what we're in. Like if it's, you know, real low year, we don't have much fish, we're gonna try to conserve. And if there's a lot of fish and there's too many fish, you know, we're gonna harvest. As long as we are here, there has to be salmon. I could not imagine not having any salmon. It's, a, it's our way of life. It brings us together. It provides healthy food, happiness, sadness, uh, great occasions. We are almost ready. A little bit of sea salt, not too heavy, but. Ready to put these on. You want to start putting them in? Sure. Get them underway. Not very many people say they can go catch their dinner and plan their dinners on what you catch. It not only saves us money, it actually is good for us, you know? It's what we were supposed to eat, what we we're supposed to always eat. Our main food 100 years ago was acorns, eels, deer meat, and fish. And that was it. So we'll go like 10 minutes each side, be done. And the sticks will actually heat up really hot right here. Anthony Bourdain should be here trying this. <laughs> and then right off the stick. There's nothing better. Right, Try a piece. Some <laughs> Salmon is as essential to the Yurok people as the air they breathe. In the 1930s, the state of California asserted its jurisdiction on the river and closed the river for Indian gillnet fishing. That didn't prohibit my family, who believed that we have that right to fish, that inherent right to fish. And so my uncles kept fishing, but they fished at night. And they continued to fish. And eventually, they did get caught. And that resulted in the Supreme Court case that reaffirmed our rights in 1976. I started out when I was 12 years old, with me and my brother. We was fishing, and uh, they was chasing us around every night. We'd go up the river and fish, and we'd come down and just had them all confused, you know. But my brother says, I'm tired of this. I said, I am too. The game wardens came up that day and picked our nets up. So we were sitting there, and they says, well, whose nets was they? And everybody looked at us. Nobody would claim them. And I said, well, I ain't going to look my net gone. And I said, I claim all five of them. The theme of the day here was can an Indian and save a salmon. And so there was a lot of animosity because we, there were a lot of fishermen that were here on the river. And so when we started to fish with nets, they were very unhappy because they had claimed ownership to the river at that point. Because he was the one who took that court case, he was a target. 
so they would stop him all the time. He had his family in this, and they came in the middle of the night, and they woke him up and got them all out of bed with their guns because they wanted to find fish at his house. You know, I mean, just the things that he's had to go through in his family because he stood up for our fishing rights, it's not okay. They didn't think something like the Salmon Wars could happen and nobody ever hear about it. It didn't seem right, it didn't seem fair. So we have 78 and we have 79. Something happened every day. It was constant, whether it was upriver, whether it was downriver. We're hearing the stories. At this point, we're frightened. We're afraid to ride in our cars alone. Whenever we plan a trip to the store, more than one person has to go. We're frightened. We're just scared all of the time. There was an elderly gentleman who had a birthday, and we took some time off from protesting, and we had salmon on the sticks down there. We had a nice fire. He'd brought his drum. There was probably an even seven children, seven women, seven men kind of group that was together. And he was singing, he had a beautiful singing voice. And right in the middle of the singing, this big flash came out the top of the mountain, up the top of the hill up here. Because of that big flash, which was not normal, we knew something was gonna happen. As soon as that happened, the cars headed on down the road. At the point that they stopped, little flashlights came on. There was over 200 little flashlights. When they hit the sandbar where we're at, they stop and then they pull off their billy clubs. This is all they're doing and coming towards us. So you're thinking in your head, I'm gonna die. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die right here and nobody will ever know the truth about the story. When they stopped, their boat started up in the river that we did not know were there. So we were surrounded. The elderly gentleman started drumming and he started singing and we all sang. We all sang and we didn't know the song, but we all knew it all of a sudden. The children sang, everyone sang the song. It got louder and louder, and then they said, let's get the hell out of here. There was a fear of our spirituality, so they left. But what happened when they left, people had wet their pants, people had thrown up. You know, we were left, we were frightened. We were left frightened. Yes, they left us. When we walked from the beach, they took from us something that we never got back. As far as healing, how can you heal Indian country and tell you, tell the truth? And maybe that's our responsibility. The story still has to be told. It didn't just happen, it's still happening. 78 and 79 for us, but look at other tribes who are still struggling. Look at us struggling over our river. That's today. You know, that is not your ancestors. This is today what's going on here. When we had the fish kill, we immediately closed our fishery because that was a sign that was a terrible imbalance in the world. And so we didn't fish, but everyone else still fished. There were thousands of dead salmon, a 12 to 15 pound salmon laying on the banks of the river, floating down the river, and they were still fishing. So senseless over a decision of the government to provide water to the farmers and not to the resource in a year where the water flows were so low and the temperatures so high. So the tribe presented data and science to say, you have got to provide what water is there to the resource to protect the fish, and they chose not to. And as a result, we had 70 to 80,000 dead Chinook salmon. And we have a lot of threatened species on the Klamath now, and we have already lost species in the Klamath. And to me, that's not acceptable in this day and time. This area hasn't seen fire in over 100 years, and it should have burned annually. Part of the practice of burning this mountain would be to help to call the salmon up the river. I consider you know, fire to be the equivalent of food for our food. It's like if we don't have fire, we don't have food for our food. It's said that the smoke carries the prayers, but the fire answers them. And so 
part of that smoke going up would shade the river and it would cool the water temperature. And so these practices, though they're conveyed through oral histories as maybe the form of a myth or a story, they actually have practical ecological purposes. The Klamath River is a lifeblood of our system. Fire is the primary force management tool. Our ceremonies are based on these relationships. Our worldview is dependent upon these relationships. And now we're in a point in time where traditional knowledge is allowing Western science to understand the physical dilemma that the landscape is in. A lot of this is all of our family fishing holes. The creek's flowing over there, and it comes up out of the ground right there, and it just creates this beautiful pool that kind of its a little sanctuary for any kind of fish that's in the river system or a baby fish that's hanging out before he heads to the ocean. This is a vital spot right here for the river because it not only cools down the river, it helps the fish that stop here and rest because the river's so hot. They come from the ocean and, you know, it's cold and they get up on the river and the river's kind of sick from being so hot and people taking water out of the river and the drought and everything just accumulating. And this spot kind of helps them out a little bit. It's like a pit stop for them, you know? They kind of get recharged. The dams will block most of all the fish that come up. I'm very concerned. There's um, water conditions, ocean conditions. Uh, right now, in this last couple of years, been very noticeable is a lot of juvenile salmon have been dying before they can go ahead and get back to the ocean to regenerate. Well, the dams create all this toxic algae, and you got all the runoffs from all the farmers, and you got the insects, pesticides, insecticides. I was warned by this in 1977 by A.U. Rock Madison Man. He's seen in the future. He said, you're going to go back to Blue Creek. I knew your grandfather. He said, you're going to lead our people, and we're going to protect our river. The last thing he said to me, don't ever let them dam our river. You have to take care of our river. So I'm the protector of a river. That's why I'm here. We've been working for a number of years to remove dams on the main stem of the Klamath River. With dam removal comes the possibility of re-establishing runs of spring chinook once again into the entire basin. Fishing is who we are. We're fishing people. So the health of that river and its resources is the health of our people. And so if the river's sick, the people are going to be sick because our ceremonies, everything, our spirituality, our strength and health is all connected to the river. We're all one. The Plains Indian tribes developed an agricultural system based on corn. Many of those original varietals were almost lost until the Sacred Seeds program began rediscovering and protecting indigenous crops and food traditions. We are not he This is what was uh, formerly known as my backyard and is uh, now home to the the four sisters corn bean, squash, and the sunflower. My Western given name is Taylor Keem, but I carry other names as well. Among the Omaha tribe, I carry the name Bagija, which means buffalo mane. This effort here is called Sacred Seed. Sacred Seed is, for the most part, around the, the Four Sisters. 
From the four sisters comes all the bounty and all of life. First sister is the corn. We know scientifically speaking that it takes a lot of minerals, most of which is nitrogen. And so the, the second sister, uh, the bean, we like the, the pole climbing beans, but they put the nitrogen right back into the soil. The uh, third sister, squash. Where there's squash, I don't know if it's in the little hairs on the vines or the flowers or what, but the raccoons will not step foot into my backyard here. And the sunflowers, they pull a lot of the heavy metals out of the ground if there's any, so it helps purify everything. But their main purpose, as I discovered again this summer, is as a windbreak. <laughs> it's an obstacle course back here. <laughs> we put a considerable amount of time and effort trying to find non-GMO indigenous heirloom seeds. Experiment with some uh, southern varietals have a green Oaxacan. We're fighting the cultural bias within it as well. Corn, especially here in Nebraska, is synonymous with apple pie. Our quote, Indian corn is only ornamental and is sold only around Thanksgiving time. And most people don't even think it's edible, but where does corn come from? <laughs> it comes from us. After I began to find seed, then I sat down with many of the elders within our tribe and asked for their advice and uh, blessing, as it were, that it would be a good thing to do again. In my mind, I envisioned a future where everyone in my tribe could be corn planters again, that somehow we could sustain ourselves, be economically self-reliant again. The whole notion that I refer to as living red is getting back to uh, living the way indigenous people should. Grow your own food. Deep red, take care of it, foster it, love it, and then it will love you back. We are not, we are not, we Traditions connect us to the past and inform our actions as we look to the future. There is much we can learn from cultural practices that will help us foster a sustainable relationship with the environment and keep the Bay Area bountiful.